Hello again, everyone. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Ellen Graney with Multnomah County, and she is going to talk to us today about youth substance use disorder screen screening in primary care, sometimes screaming, and best practices and workflow. I was clapping for you. I'm just kidding. Um, hi, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Ellen, um, and I am going to uh, say a couple things. Um, one, it's I'm very I'm very humbled to be up here. We've had some incredible juggernauts um, of presenters, people that I personally look up to, have learned from, have had the privilege of working alongside of, including Amanda Risser. Um, this morning we worked together in a methadone clinic, um, and so this is kind of my vote to be like. There will always be somebody that knows more than you, and you will always know more than somebody else. Um, and we have to think about ourselves along the spectrum. Um, it's taken a long time for people to strong arm me to get to being a presenter, because I've just always been the person that's like, I know somebody. I have this other person. Let me get you connected to so-and-so. Um, and at some point, you kind of have to be that person, and that's maybe inside your clinic or whatever. Um, so this is a really important work, and not very many of us know what we're doing. Um, so you just kind of have to like accept at some point that you are a person that can help somebody else. Okay, yeah, so we're gonna talk about screening and brief intervention. We're gonna talk a lot about a bunch of other stuff also. Um, this is kind of a bait and switch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I really wanna talk to you a lot about the things I actually say to teenagers about drugs. Um, that's m what a lot of us need more of, and the questions that I ask that I think are actually more effective than the validated screening tools that we have, um, and some other things. Okay, so I don't have any financial disclosures. <laughs> um, uh, I do want to talk a little bit about where I'm coming from. I think that's really important. Um, I am not a person who is in recovery, but I do identify as a person who is a cycle breaker, so um, I did not end up dependent on drugs, um, which is not the case for most of my family. Um, so I got very lucky and had just enough people in my life where the time, like, in an alternate timeline, I'm dead. In this timeline, I'm standing in front of you. Um, and so I, that's kind of like a perspective that I always have as far as like the humility I have with this work. And also this work is really personal to me because I currently love people who use drugs. Um, I have lost many, many, many people to drug use. Um, and as this says, uh, the stigma um, and our systems that fail people um, or are just insufficient. Um, so this is deeply personal to me. My, fa uh, my father's cousin just died from a fentanyl overdose um, not that long ago. So this is still affecting my family. This work is personal to me. Um, I am a behavioral health provider that works in three of our Multnomah County Health Department primary care clinics. Um, I have a counterpart, Mandy Clark. Um, which means that I have three clinics that I travel between, um, and I am specifically a SUDS and medication for SUDS specific person. Um, what I really wanna say about that today is that like, there are some prescribers in here, there are people who work in primary care, um, so I understand that our medical providers have a thousand plus person panels, that they have 15 to 20 minutes to do everything, um, a well child check, a sports physical, whatever it is with like the youth that is coming into your office, a post hospital follow up, whatever has gotten that teenager through the door to you. There are a hundred things that are pulling your attention. I'm not here to give you four more buttons to click. You don't need any more buttons to click. I know that. Um, I'm not here to tell you to do eight more things when you are already doing 800 things. I want you to have some more tools. I want you to feel more equipped. I want you to have some things in your brain where you're like, oh, the thing happened. The thing happened that I've been preparing for. What am I supposed to do? I want you to have a couple of things um, <laughs> in your back pocket. Um, and I want you to feel a little bit less like, wow, this feels really hard. Um, uh, and I just want to say that my, my slides are bad um, for like a presentation because there's a ton of information on it. But I'm just acknowledging that like you're going to go back and read this stuff. Um, Um, these are some goals that I have for you. <laughs> I want you to feel better equipped. I want you to identify a goal. Um, and I want you to receive and follow up with the resources that I provide to you because I'm going to provide you a lot of things. Training, places to go to to learn about drugs, what drugs are, 
how people use those drugs, how to talk to people about drugs, um, lots of things that I have used to educate myself on the stuff that I'm less aware of. Um, so these are the two most validated, most utilized screening tools um, for primary care for people uh, 12 to 17. We've got the lovely craft, and then we've got the lesser known, but still has been around for a long time, and people use uh, S2BI, which is a NIDA developed um, screening tool. Um, and the craft really focuses on like experiences, um, and the S2BI focuses on like drugs and how often they are used and how much they're used. Um, and it's just kind of like going from like, let's just screen everyone about drugs. Um, both continue to be validated, both continue to stand up. Uh, there's some evidence to just use both. <laughs> um, uh, in Multnomah County, we use the craft plus like the individual person maybe doing some follow-up. Um, there's links to all of that stuff. I want you to, I want to point um, to the top where there's like the SAMHSA advisory and the thing that says excellent article. Those are two really, really great resources that I want you to follow up on. on that's going to go really in depth about primary care screening and like kind of in the current era um, and has like more links and resources and like other things. Um, so I could have gone through all of that, but I want you to go to it. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so who are we actually talking to? Um, because I think when we think, a lot of people think about screening, we're thinking about like we want to like catch youth who are using drugs, and we want to intervene with them, and we want them to we want to refer them to treatment. I'm supposed to stay over here. I'm going to do a bad job about that. Um, <laughs> uh, and I really think about it, it's a really enormous spectrum, um, and that if we are using a screening tool or we're using any type of like screening protocol, we are actually at any point can do an intervention with anybody that we ask those questions to, even if they answer no to everything that is still an opportunity for an intervention. Um, and it's probably, honestly, the place in primary care to do more with the end of the spectrum that we're, we think that we're less worried about, which is, you, I think there should be like universal education opportunities, universal like fentanyl awareness, universal questions. I have some ideas about how to do that later. Um, so we've got like, like, like so youth have questions. <laughs> they have questions about drugs, the reality of drugs in our society. Youth are worried about their friends, they're worried about their family, they're worried about acquaintances, they're worried about their community. They are. They want information, they want to be a good citizen, they want to take care of people. Um, and we have an ability um, to provide that, or an opportunity. Um, and then we've kind of got the things that go up from like maybe people are thinking about using drugs, or they're like, they're not using drugs yet, but they're like, I don't know, this is really rough. I'm having a really, really rough time. And like, I've said no to so-and-so five times, but I think I might say yes next time, because like, uh, this is just too hard. Um, and then we've got the folks further down, who are occasionally using and then are consistently using. Um, in primary care, we're gonna continue to see mostly cannabis use, and then after that, alcohol use, and then other stuff after that. Um, and I think that there's kind of like this stopping where it's like, all right, so you're using cannabis. Do you wanna talk about that? No. Um, and then let's cut, we gotta like just stop. <laughs> um, I gotta have some extra ideas about potential other questions to follow up with when somebody is ambivalent about their use, pre-contemplative about, about their use, um, like doesn't have any questions. They do, they do have questions. It's just about the right, us having the right question um, and trying it out. Um, and they might still say no and be like, I wanna stop talking to you, that's fine. Um, I have actually found that most of them, there is a thing. There is a thing that they want to better understand. Um, we have the opportunity with all of these different folks to provide accurate and frank information about drugs and alcohol, their impact on physical and mental health, resources and supports, yada, yada, yada. Um, I really want to highlight the thing that's underlined, a space to explore what kinds of decisions they want to make. 
Um, youth almost never want us to hand them a thing blank. So you screened positive um, in your craft or your S2BI, um, and you meet criteria for a referral to treatment. Here is a handout. I would like you to go to treatment. <laughs> um, that's not how that works. Um, and that's a thing that I think a lot of people have gotten used to being like, this is the only thing I can do. A lot of providers, a lot of folks in primary care are really burnt out with the like screening burnout. <laughs> I'm screening for 8 million things, and I have very little that I can do for most of those things. What am I, s and, then, and, well, and this is kind of the like, don't ask, don't tell of primary care. I don't want to know if I don't know what to do. I don't want to know if I don't have something to do for you. Um, and I really, really, really honor that and know that that comes from a place of just many, many parts of our system that do not work. Um, and I do think that there is more that we can do and we need to like also know that like you can still be a caring unconditional an unconditional caring adult in this youth's life that is offering them information isn't telling them what to do isn't judging them for what they're doing is like just wanting to like ally with them and advocate for them and to provide them life-saving information because you just care whether or not they're dead like um and most youth want harm reduction. Most youth just want a frank conversation. They just want honesty. They just want you to be a real person. That is the most consistent feedback I get from youth. Or like, you're like a real person. <laughs> I believe that you give a crap. I believe you, you really care, huh? Is a thing I get. And I think that might say a lot about youth interactions with adults if they're really flabbergasted that somebody <laughs> like really cares about them and they believe that they really care about them. That is our strongest tool. Um, and it's probably the thing that like we all, again, I have some practical things for how you can communicate that like you really do care about them. Um, uh, but yeah, this space to explore is really important. Youth want to be able to like explore what their options are. They want to know what they are. A huge tool for you is just understanding how all these systems work. What are the levels of care? What to expect if you were to go to outpatient treatment? What happens there? If you don't know, call the outpatient clinic and be like, hey, um, I would like to refer to you. I would really like to understand how this all works. They want to talk to you. They want to answer your questions. You can also contact me. I'm happy to answer your questions also. My information will be at the end. Um, it's really important to understand. Peer support services, where are those? What happens there? Youth want information. They, they don't want a scrap of paper that has a number on it, um, and our adults don't either. Um, most of them want to just know what the smorgasbord is, understand that it exists, understand that any part of it could be helpful, um, and that um, like, you're, like you're, you don't have an expectation or an agenda. Um, I have a thing later, but I'll say it now. I say this all the time, and it's really effective for everybody of every age. I don't really have an agenda, except that I really prefer for people to be alive, and I really prefer that they have as much information as possible so that they can make the best decisions for themselves possible. That's really effective. It's really useful. It, I get positive responses to that all the time. Um, and it's usually something like, thank you. <laughs> like. Okay, like, and then and usually like a chuckle because I'm saying like I just really prefer for people to be alive if I'm honest, um, and they're like, okay, like, like I can I can I can do that, um, yeah. So just want to think about it is like there's this always an opportunity for an agenda for an intervention. There's always an opportunity to provide a little bit more information. I'm gonna pause and to see if there's any questions right now or thoughts that people have before I go forward. Yeah, Kat. You know, you know I'm kind of, yeah. I just want to validate like I do the same thing with adults right it's just like my like biggest concern or my biggest thing is like your safety and it'd be great if you didn't die like I try to be like a little silly about it very frank like um, so it's like yeah like how can we make what you're doing more safe like just being really honest about it yeah I mean so um, again there's other things I'm going to say later but like 
really a lot of interventions that we use with adults that are really effective are useful for working with people who are under the age of um, 18. And I would say like, there's even like a greater amplification where I think that even more direct, even more frank um, humor is super effective. Um, I kind of have a certain kind of personality that kind of happens to work with the work that I do, but I have providers who are like the most clinical, I don't know if I've ever seen them smile, um, <laughs> like people who are still effective providers that like that youth respond well to. So like, um, it's, it's really about like the intention you're bringing into the room, the information you're bringing into the room, how you talk about what you talk about. And, it, and those things are way more important than all of the other stuff. Um, also, like the more comfortable you get, the more yourself you are. And I can promise you, this is true for adults that use drugs, um, that like, like they know within like 10 seconds of you being in the room, what you're about, how you feel about them. Like it is instinct, it is survival, they know instantly half that for young people, five seconds. Five seconds, they have read you to filth. <laughs> and they will tell you. Um, a, a young person will absolutely let me know that there's, a, there's something on my sweater. An, an adult would never. Um, <laughs> adults say things like, um, you know, hey, like you're like really direct and a young person will be like, like, are there people that, like, you're a little too much for? <laughs> um, and I'm like, absolutely. That is absolutely true. Thank you very much. Um, being, like, kind of a little bit assaulted by a teenager is actually a really good compliment because that means that they feel totally safe. So if they have, like, if you get, like, a little, like, ribbed by a teenager, you're in. It's, like, rapport has been built, um, and you can work with that. Um, so like just like be like like it warms my cockles when I get like um uh made fun of. Um <laughs> um okay, so importance of language. Um like I really want to talk about like this dignity, humanity, love, facts, information. Like uh if I had a spiritual leaning, that's what it is. <laughs> dignity, humanity, love, facts, uh information. Um and I think young people are victims of dehumanization for their age. Um, young people experience great ageism. They are treated like they are like really tiny humans um, and um, that they don't have thoughts and opinions and complex lives and complex thoughts about things and that they are just impulsive and they just do things without thinking and they, they, don't, they don't have a developed prefrontal cortex um, and all of these things. And, and when you actually hang out with young people, um, and then I always give the caveat that like, I don't know a lot about young people that don't do drugs. Um, <laughs> like the average uh, American teenager, um, I don't know that much about. Um, so when I say that, like, I really love working with teenagers, I always have to give the caveat of like, all the teenagers that I know use drugs um, or have used drugs. Um, but like just having that like as, as like as an orientation and as a mantra as a thing that like you put it by your computer and like have it be something that like grounds you when like you're worried or you're frustrated you're going into an appointment that you're like I feel really uncomfortable about this appointment um, because I don't there's this like the thing in the note is not something I'm great at <laughs> the thing in the note is going to take 84 years the thing that like you have that like chest thing that happens, and I know it happens because I consider my providers my patients sometimes, um, because I'm providing them a lot of the support, <laughs> you know, for this stuff, so I know, um, and I tell people all the time that doctors are some of the most anxious people I've ever met, um, and that they all need, like, like, like a lot of support, so, um, but if you ground yourself in some things that are just true, and you're like, this is my intention going into the room, we actually have data and statistics that I didn't put on here because you're just going to believe me. Um, that shows that like the intention we have, that if we set an intention each time we go into a room, um, it actually has a really large effect on the success of that visit from the patient's perspective um, and from the provider's perspective. Um, we have really great data on especially like persistent pain, which are some of the most difficult uh, primary care visits. Um, 
like setting intention is one of the things that you can do to improve your practice. Um, uh, Young people deserve to know what we're doing and why we do it and what happens with that information. Um, almost nobody tells them this stuff, <laughs> I have found. Um, so I think we need to just tell them, hey, um, so we screen because it is recommended uh, by the American Pediatric Society. Or, you know, like we have, like we're doing this because this is a protocol and workflow. We're doing this because uh, we believe that everyone has like the right to information, and this helps me understand what type of information you might uh, want or need, or what, you know, have lots of ways to talk about it. But if you are doing a screening with a young person, tell them why. <laughs> it, that builds rapport. You're saying, I believe that you can make decisions about yourself. I trust you. Um, I think that like you can understand this stuff. So like your rapport, they feel like, well, oh, and they realize, like, oh, man, you know what? Like, nobody's really, like, sat down and explained that to me before. Um, this adult might just be somebody I could talk to. We want that part of the brain to go, this, I, I might be able to tell this person something, and they're not going to respond like all the other adults in my life that I've tried to talk to. I might just tell this person something that I haven't told somebody else. Um, uh, I, I, so I'm a behavioral health provider, and I have worked in the primary care system for seven years. Uh, it's really not effective the vast majority of time to tell somebody that you're referring them to behavioral health. Um, people don't feel great about that, and it's also like not terminology that people are familiar with. Or like, I'm going to refer to you to a counselor. I'm going to refer you to a the therapist. Um, I think we kind of need to just use the most creative language possible, health coach. Um, is something that we've like just found is really effective in the primary care setting. Um, something like, hey, I have this person. This is a, this is something that like my providers have kind of like done because I've given them a lot of coaching. Um, hey, I have a person in the clinic that's an expert on this stuff. I am not. Would you like to talk to that person? Without any of the words. <laughs> um, uh, hey, you know what, my like. My colleague, Ellen, this is her wheelhouse. She knows about this stuff. She wants to talk to you about this stuff. She doesn't have an agenda. She's not going to judge you. Like, would you like to talk to her about this some more? It seems like you have a lot of questions. Uh, I wish I had those answers for you. I'm trying to work on that. But I do have somebody here in the clinic that loves those questions and would love to answer them. Um, like, how, like, just how to, like, connect this, this person is somebody that I trust. This person is somebody that knows more than me about this. This person has more time than I do, et cetera. Um, I have more to say about that later. I'm going to check my time. Um, um, so we we'll try to do warm handoffs as much as possible. There's room in our schedule. Um, for that, um, we highly, highly, especially if, like, if a youth wants to talk to somebody about drugs, I will do whatever it takes um, to talk to that person <laughs> um, immediately. Um, and this is like, tel like telemed too. Like we do telemed same like warm handoffs, where it's like I'm going to transfer this person to you from my phone, um, or hey, I'm going to call. Like I do have to wrap up this other call, but I'm going to call them like in, in a little bit. Um, so we try to do that as much as possible, scheduling as much as possible. But um, one great thing about being kind of like the SUD specific behavioral health provider, and there are other regular behavioral health providers in our clinic, is that I have a much more flexible schedule and that is purposeful. Um, because so like our other behavioral health providers are like scheduled out a month. I have a, like appointments on Monday. Um, I would have appointment probably a couple of appointments tomorrow if we were not closed. Um, and so, like, as far as our workflow in our clinic, basically it's like, if it's anything drugs related, it goes to Ellen. <laughs> like, um, and that's, I do smoking cessation. Like, it's like the whole spectrum or like the questions or like, hey, I am a parent and my youth is using drugs and I would like to understand more about the resources that are available. It's kind of like the full spectrum. Um, that works for us. Again, I have more to say about that later. Um, document their strengths. I actually have a dot phrase um, <laughs> that I use to make sure that I document strengths. 
Um, I think that our default um, dot phrases should include patient strengths. Um, and then I need you to like tell the person the strengths that you're observing. <laughs> um, that's really awesome. Um, uh, and be like really specific. Um, like if you're seeing something, tell them. This is true for everybody, but this is especially true for youth. Um, I want you to, and this is again, all this stuff is like universal, but like it's just like like really, 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 really even more important for young people. I was like, what stigma have they experienced already, or that they're afraid of? What trauma have they experienced already? And they and they will. Um, so like we have adults in our offices that like. 40 years, they've got 40 years of stuff since the first time, since like the first time that they started using. And so it's like, what trauma could we prevent? Um, uh, yeah, and then shame and grief. Um, and again, our young people have been so thoroughly dehumanized by our entire society. Um, we, uh, and this is just true for kind of like, you know, like we see this like with like people talking about millennials, which I am. Um, like, it's, there's just this really strong thread in our society of culture and culture of ageism, that younger people don't know anything and they don't deserve our time and energy and effort and they're dumb and impulsive and short-sighted, um, when in reality, the young folks <laughs> that I see in my office care way more about their community than I think the average person in the boomer generation did when they were that um, age. And in actual, like, all of their community, everybody, not just a certain s section of it. Um, they're some of the most creative, dynamic. I think they're totally going to just flip this whole thing, um, if I'm 100% honest. Um, I want us to eliminate whether or not a person is compliant to a treatment. Um, I want us to be really carefully examine the language that we use. Um, young people read their charts more than older people. Almost every young person that I meet has activated their ability to look at their chart and their documentation and their my chart. They see what you write. Um, so do not put something in your note that you would not say to somebody's face. Um, and then I think that this is like, you get that you hear this all the time. Like, I think that that's mo even more important than like, well, don't put something in your note that you wouldn't want to read on a stand in a courtroom, which is like the other thing you, like we all kind of know. Um, language that I recommend is patient declined, blah, blah, blah. Um, instead of refused. I also want us to re eliminate refused. Um, declined is more patient-centered and is like more like, it's like not judgmental. It's just factual. I want us to really stick to facts. Uh, the patient decided not to do the thing that I recommended. That's fine. Um, hey, this plan was developed between the PCP and person name includes blah, blah, blah. Um, so this is really, and this next part is really important in Multnomah County where we have patients that speak 150 languages. <laughs> um, uh, but um, just in general, like primary language, culture, faith, like they're refugee and immigrants, all of these things impact people's access to care. So for example, we have almost nothing for youth and then we have actually nothing for youth that do not speak English or Spanish. Um, so like I, and this is, and this is, and I said that's also true for our older adults. We have no peer services for people that speak most of the languages spoken in our region. Uh, withdrawal management is not accessible to youth. Our withdrawal management is also not accessible uh, to people who speak languages other than English and Spanish. Um, almost no drug and alcohol treatment facility can effectively provide like interpretive services on demand. Um, this is something that in primary care we are much, much better equipped to do. Multnomah County is really lucky. We have three contracts with with services for interpretation, interpretation, so I can at any time get somebody on the phone who can speak any language. Um, and that means that I can kind of more effectively take care of somebody and more effectively provide them services than our community can. And that's a big bummer, and I hate that. And also, it's like, well, where else are they going to go? <laughs> um, uh, gender identity and sexual orientation. So I know that everyone knows this, but I'm always going to say it. I'm a second generation queer person. 
um, and uh, meaning that my two moms and myself identify as queer, um, we really, really underserve LGBTQ plus um, youth. Um, and they are much more likely to have less people in their life that, that give a crap. Um, uh, we have a large population of young people that come here after being kicked out of their family unit, escaping their family unit of origin, um, who want to be somewhere where it's less likely that they will die, where it's less likely that they will be like judged for like the relationship <laughs> that they're in, that they want to have, the people that they're attracted to, how they present their gender. Um, we have way better, we have much more that we could do in our community and we're doing better than most communities. Um, so, uh, and we kind of like, the so something to kind of do a vote for is 4D Recovery, which is a peer support service in our region, just opened their program for youth under the age of 17. And every Sunday they have an LGBTQ specific group um, for support. Um, and so I think that's like, and then outside in is like our juggernaut, they've always done the best care for young people um, who are LGBTQ. And so it's just like be aware of like where people can go, what does exist, even if it's, even if it's one thing, even if it's one thing that you can talk to them about, like it can help them feel a little bit less hopeless and maybe they never do that thing, but they know it exists. Um, Okay, I'm spending a lot of time on this slide, but I care a lot about language. Um, just that like building trust and reducing stigma should be like our, should be like mantras in every step of our system from like the patient access center that they call, whatever that looks like at your clinic, um, no matter what kind of clinic you're in, um, the front desk, like every level, where's the opportunity to decrease stigma? Um, what was the opportunity for us to use the best language po we possibly can? Because somebody might hear something on that initial call trying to schedule an appointment and be like, absolutely the fuck not. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> uh, like, no, like that's it. Like that is my cutoff. Like I heard a word um, and that is it for me. Um, so there's just opportunities. Again, I have stuff that we do in our clinics to try to work on that. Okay, this is my favorite slide. Um, uh, uh, again, I'm a millennial and I was an emo kid. Um, I'm still an emo kid inside of my heart. Um, uh, and so, like, I hear very consistently from a lot of people that teenagers scare them. Uh, they're, they're worried about working with teenagers. They feel like in t teenagers are intimidating. Um, and I just want you to know that teenagers know that. <laughs> like, young people know. <laughs> uh, again, that, like, kind of first five seconds, like, kind of what your vibe is, um, what your intention is. They're very, they have very, very, very sensitive uh, ability to like pick up on that. Um, which is why like that setting intention into the room is like, just do the thing that you're scared of is my, is a big takeaway. Like, um, again, like you know, Amanda Risser is like this juggernaut and she's, and she's been doing stuff for 20 years. Um, and we've like, there's like most of the stuff we do is cause like she did it first. Um, like, and almost all of her stories are like, we didn't know what we were doing. We just knew we had to do something. So we did something and we figured it out later. So I, my biggest takeaway and recommendation today is like, do, do the stuff that you can, just, just see how it goes. <laughs> um, try. Try some questions, try some statements, um, try some different things and just, cause like, it doesn't, like it can't hurt. Um, ooh, aha, uh -huh, got a thing. Here are some d websites that I trust for information about drugs um, and talking to teenagers about drugs um, and providing information to teenagers about drugs. Um, and like, uh, I, have some st I have other trainings and stuff later for you. Um, Dance Safe. Awesome. Um, again, like harm reduction and youth and all these things. Uh, so you're like, Ellen, Ellen, I really do not know enough about any of this stuff to be talking to any about about it. Um, here, go here. Um, I trust all of these people. Um, uh, okay, I just want to tell you that we've done a lot of research for a long time, all the time, 
Talking to teens about drugs and drug use does not increase the likelihood that they use drugs. Um, giving them frank, harm reduction um, focused, um, factual information actually decreases the likelihood that they ever try drugs, that they cease using drugs, that they reduce using drugs. That stuff shows it all the time. All the time we have stuff that proves that. Um, uh, and this is, this is just a thing about like primary care. Um, so teenagers do not have long medication lists. They do not have several complex medical conditions, several specialists, like all these things that like are just routine part of our primary care that we do all the time and that is much, much harder. Um, so we've done some, like we're doing Suboxone for young people in Multnomah County and like the feedback I get from providers is like, wow, they're like on one other medication. <laughs> I like, really? <laughs> um, wow, they don't have any medical conditions other than mental health and substance use. Oh, they've got some asthma. We need to refill their inhaler. Okay. Um, so that's just like my vote for like, <laughs> I think this is way less difficult <laughs> than a lot of the stuff we do all the time. Um, where it's like a lot of my patients on Suboxone that are adults have like congestive heart failure and sleep apnea and like totally like unmedicated diabetes and like mil like a whole bunch of they're not taking any of their medications and they're like they're like four specialists that like would be great if they were seeing and we're, we're prescribing this a box and being like we don't want you to die um so i just like here's my vote <laughs> for like interventions and medication actually being like like there's just like i just want we can we can worry a lot less did you have a question I'm wondering, in your experience, what you've seen providers in terms of sort of interacting and sort of assessing adults versus youth and kind of how you've navigated that. Because in my experience, it seems like there is a different energy around youth that sometimes can be helpful and sometimes can be barrier filled versus adults. Um, yeah, so I think that uh, most providers are pretty like, like either they're very uncomfortable screening youth, they're much more f uncomfortable screening youth, uh, f uh, or even talking to youth about this stuff than they are adults. Um, I think that's a lot better with like, cause like I exist and so people can come and talk, be like, hey, Ellen, uh, could you help me? <laughs> I'm like on site continuing education. So that is something that like works really well for us is the people that are uncomfortable become comfortable. My favorite story is that I have a provider seven years ago that when I first started this position that was like, none of my patients use drugs. I'm never prescribing Suboxone. Never. I don't care. I'm not going to do it like that. Like I, they, they were very judgmental. And now they're my person that's like, Ellen, I read this research study. Can we do like this? I think we could try this thing with this patient I have. And it's kind of like experimental. What do you think about that? Um, and like literally, like that's just me being like persistent and being like, so I know that you're really uncomfortable prescribing this medication. I'd like to, can I talk to you about why I'm not worried about it? Um, or like, okay, you're prescribing this medication. So you're really worried about uh, prescribing to them and they're using cannabis. Can I show you some research articles about why you don't need to worry about that? <laughs> um, and also like my personal experience working with these three other providers where like nothing bad happened when we continued Suboxone and then like from there. And now they're my person that's like, I would like to do this experimental thing. Um, so just know that like, like for all of us, it's like a learning process and we just have to keep talking to people that know this stuff and know more and can direct us to the information we need. Um, I'm gonna, Move on, because, yeah. So I notice that sometimes I have too much chill <laughs> about <laughs> prescribing, which is great, because I have providers that, I mean, I can't sign that prescription. So yeah. um, it's always good to have checks. But I guess I don't have a question so much as just like, I am noticing in myself, because I've been doing this work with Bub for so long, that like, yeah, I'm terrified to do this with kids, but we're going to do it anyway, because, yeah. you know, that's just what we do. <laughs> we, like you said, like we face the thing we're scared of and we do it anyway, um, because what's the other choice? But yeah, I don't know. I just, I, I guess I don't have a question. I was just noticing that like, I have a lot of chill about prescribing this medication, especially with adults. And yeah, it's been interesting navigating that with providers who are like, but they're still using meth. And I'm like, yeah, we all know. 
it's not, you know, that this doesn't treat meth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so what I hear inside of there is the like, like at what point are we like, are we causing harm? You know, are we, are we not doing enough? Um, what else could we be doing? Um, is what we're doing effective? Um, and I think that one, I ask myself that stuff all the time too, because I always want to check myself. Um, and so one, I think uh, no matter what, bup saves lives. No matter what, that's the like returning to opioid use is the greatest risk to all of our patients. And wow, we're finding fentanyl in like everything more and more consistently. Like not like we used to like probably two years ago we thought it was like as consistent as it is now. <laughs> um, but like methamphetamine and we're finding fentanyl and methamphetamine. So I think it's just like continued uh, patient education and awareness, making sure that they have Narcan, refilling the Narcan. Um, and like, I think the big thing is like not just completely letting it go under the bus and just be like, we're going to stop talking about it. Um, that's kind of my note for kind of everything is like anything that like, we still want to talk about it. We still want to ask questions about it. Hey, how's that going? Um, oh, you know, like I am using meth, but I'm using like a few times a week now. Like, so sometimes we just need an update, like on like what is actually going on. Um, so myself and my counterpart, we support all of our Suboxone patients. Um, and so they have appointments with us when they have um, appointments with the providers. And like, this is a lot of what we're doing. Um, again, that works for our system. Uh, I'm not gonna read all this stuff to you. These are just questions. Uh, that I ask that are effective. I get responses from people appreciate. They tell me nobody's ever asked me that question before. Um, like, how are you staying safer? How are you preventing overdose? How are you? Like, ask them before you'd give them information. What do you already know? What do you already know about fentanyl? Um, uh, who do you trust to talk to about drugs? and alcohol that's just imp like and that's like non-judgmental it's just impor important for you to know if their best friend carly is the information person that they have or if they talk to their uncle rob who's four years in sobriety that's important information to know um you know are you interested in understanding the help that is available for people who use substances in case it can help somebody you know. Um, there's just a lot. When, like, bringing in community or, like, how to care take care of their friends or how to provide information to other people is, like, the one of our most effective ends for getting somebody to actually talk about what's going on for them. And is also, our young people are the most likely to reverse an overdose for another young person. It is probably not going to be an adult. It is going to be another young person. So this is where I talk about the fact that I recommend that everybody 10 and up carries Narcan and knows the signs of an opioid overdose. Um, that is where we're at. Um, uh, okay, so I'm just going to click through. Uh, here's other things I say. Literal quotes. This is stuff I say all the time. These, please take them. Please use them. Don't reinvent the wheel if you don't want to. Um, this is my favorite. Somebody really wants you to be here, and you really don't want to be. <laughs> Ideally, it's very rare, but people do send to end up in my office like without their can like really express like wanting to be there. Like. This is time set aside for you. We can talk about whatever you want. Uh, that ends up being a video game conversation, which I'm comfortable. I play video games, but you don't need to know that much about video games to talk to them about it. Like, what's your favorite? What are you playing right now? Is that on the computer or on the PS5? <laughs> <laughs> I'm cracking up because <laughs> that is what's going on in my head. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, uh, and this, this is also where I talk about like so like, like the, pre the one of the, my previous slides about teenagers, I didn't go through all of that. Like, don't try to be cool because like you're not. I am not cool. Um, I am a tremendous nerd. I read five books a week. I play video games. I crochet little tiny animals. Um, like the only cool thing I do is like lift heavy weights. Like that's like the only thing that I do that like maybe has a cool factor. Everything else is like really nerdy and I can promise you that you have a, like a thing that you're nerdy about. Like go with like, what, wh what questions would you want somebody to ask you about your thing? That like you like, whatever it is. I, Civil War movies, 
Like, what's the thing where you're like, I would like to talk to you about all day about the thingy? Um, like, ask youth, like, what do you do? Like, a lot of young people are, like, on Discord, they're on social media, like, they're connected to people in, like, a lot of different really creative ways. Um, so even if they're, like, not, like, hanging out IRL with humans, like, they're probably hanging out on the internet somewhere with other humans. Um, uh, youth Era um, is an incredible um, kind of like youth-based support organization. It's not SUDS specific exactly, but they kind of do all of the things and they have like all kinds of Discord servers and it's just about like supportive, like healthy, like connections and like doing rad stuff and like just like being a young person who like can hang out with other young people in like lots of different kinds of spaces. They have physical spaces, online spaces. Um, and that's just like a great place for like the young person that's like, yeah, I actually don't have any friends. Um, I was a young person that didn't have any friends. I had two moms in the 90s in a religious community on the southwest side of Chicago um, in poverty. So like, I didn't have a whole lot of friends. Um, and I would have loved something like youth ERA um, era. Um, okay, and this is like evidence-based practices that I use in case that's uh, helpful to you. Um, all of these things are things that medical providers can also like, like, there's no rules what trainings you go to. I just want you to know that. I go to trainings all the time that are, like, say, like, this is for a medical provider. I have an addiction medicine certificate from OHSU. Like, there's no rules. Social workers can go to medical things. Like, medical people can go to social worker stuff. And in fact, please do, because <laughs> you are going to get information there that is way different and is going to be way more effective for your practice. Um, I'm running out of time. Here's some stuff about diagnosis. Um, so what I wanted to title this presentation was please do not uh, assign a cocaine use disorder diagnosis to a young person that you snorted two lines of cocaine off a toilet lid six months ago. Um, that's not the title that I gave. <laughs> that's not the title I gave this presentation. Also, this is being recorded, which is like a funny thing I have to keep reminding myself of. Um, be accurate. Use the 11 point criteria. If it's a use disorder, diagnose a use disorder. Add the modifiers. Please, a cocaine, uh, like a mild alcohol use disorder is a very different thing than a severe alcohol use disorder where somebody is meeting all 11 criteria. Um, Diagnosis is stick. They will be there forever. There are diagnoses in charts that I have of 25-year-olds that were given to them when they were 11. Some of our patients, have, like especially with Epic, that stuff, like, and if it's like no longer active, please, <laughs> please make it a historical diagnosis. Put history of blank use. Blank history, uh, like, like this use disorder is in remission. Use all of that descriptive language. Um, this is where I also say, if you haven't already, please stop using um, like abuse, like alcohol abuse, cocaine abuse. Y use use, just use use. Um, uh, and then talk to the, if you are giving a diagnosis, <laughs> tell, tell the person. Tell them, do not, this is true for everybody, especially if, true, if you want a young person to trust you, you need to tell them everything that you are doing and why you are doing it and talk to them about it. Hey, you know, hey, you meet the criteria like for blah, blah, blah. Here is why. Would you like to look at this with me? I do this with adults. I show them the 11 point criteria. I'm like, hey, this is what this means. Like you said yes to like all these questions or you just told me that 20 minute story and I heard all of these things like have a conversation and actually that conversation is incredibly useful when it comes to motivation when it comes to, to somebody understanding what is going on for them a lot of people actually have no idea how severe the thing is that's going on with them they actually have no we, we, we make a lot of assumptions um, but most of them don't know uh, so here's my shortcut. This is the four C's. Compulsion, craving, consequences, control. So if you don't have the 11 point criteria in front of you, you can't remember it. Compulsion, craving, consequences, control. If somebody is using a drug and they don't feel compelled to do it, they don't have a craving for it, they haven't had any consequences yet, they don't, like there doesn't seem to be like, like a true lack of control, they don't have a use disorder. They are using drugs, but they do not have a use disorder. Um, so like, 
like this is important information, but like man, the impact is even more important for our young people. Um, and I see I see stuff in church all the time where I'm like, oh, and I message people. <laughs> I'm like, we need to change that. Here's some stuff um, about. So here, become a person in your organization that can support others, champion training, champion hiring, and onboarding practices. If you don't have a person, be, you, you're now the person. I've knighted you. <laughs> you're here. You care enough about this, and you now know more than most of your colleagues do. Especially if this is your fourth day. Frickin' like, absolute champion. Like, and again, as a person who's been like, I, mm, you know, mm -mm. <laughs> like that's not me, and somebody else, I would, I would like to introduce you to Lydia Bartholo. She could come and talk to you. Um, you're now the person. <laughs> you need to accept that you're the person. Um, uh, I think everyone who works in a primary care clinic should have training on substance use disorders, stigma, medications for substance use disorders. It is not helpful if the person answering the phone doesn't know what Suboxone is. It is not helpful if the person answering the phone is going to react badly to a person scheduling an appointment who is under the age of 18 who would like to talk about their drug use. Like, every single level of your organization has to have, and this is the big one, we have a lot of turnover, we struggle with this at Multnomah County. Every single person who works in our clinic gets onboarding with me, whether they are a eligibility specialist, whether or not they're a clinical pharmacist, whether or not they're a front desk person, whether or not, uh, like anybody who is in the primary care clinic, when they are onboarding and they are starting their job, they get at least 30 minutes um, with me. Medical providers get 60. Um, and we get to talk about how my job intersects with their job, how to connect somebody to me, if they inter interact with somebody, like I answer their questions, I give them a handout <laughs> on like stuff. We talk about stigma, we talk about like how important they are, and that like their job, regardless of what it is, could be the reason that somebody comes to me and gets the help that they need, um, and that they are important and vital. And you know what that does? People feel awesome. They feel important, and also. This is just an aside. I've been told people stick around <laughs> if they feel like they are doing important work. I have had uh, um, more than one front desk person be like, Ellen, whenever I think about getting a job somewhere else, I think about the fact that maybe somebody I'm checking in and being kind to is going to get the help they need from you today. And so I think that we have a lot to say about like how highlighting this work like is and like, and how, we, like, what we can do, and that it's very that these very small things can add up, like, is actually stuff that can help people stay. Um, uh, here's the questions that I think I think hiring questions. Why are we not asking about people's suds experience when they are getting hired? Uh, if I'm on the hiring committee, I do. Um, if I get asked what I want to know, um, man, does this new MA have experience? Like, when the, oh, this is like my favorite thing. An MA that has experience working with providers who prescribe Suboxone, those, they're the juggernauts. Medical assistants who take care of a provider schedule, who work with patients consistently who use Suboxone, um, are, like, they run the whole thing. They know how to schedule properly. They know the importance. They know the importance of the medication. And they are, like, my, some of my favorite people. I buy them things, um, and I, I bring them cake. And I like, and I am just like, I got, I've got a few that I'm just like, you are my favorite person. <laughs> um, uh, and this is just the thing about like, a lot of people who have training in SUDS don't often have experience with adolescence, so we just have to have it. Um, I want all organizations to prioritize training for all, again, all levels of their staff, ongoing training, because like, so at onboarding and then ongoing follow-up training for all staff. Um, at Multnomah County, this means I go to roll groups on a fairly consistent basis. Um, I like go and talk to our community health workers for questions. What's coming up? What referrals are you getting? What question, and I do their Narcan training and get them Narcan and like things like that. Um, so I just think that like, this is how we create a system that like better takes care of people who use drugs, is if like everybody is on board and everyone has information that they need for their job okay 
this is a really terrible slide about our stuff that we do. I said a lot of these things. Um, uh, critically, I, I had to give these presentation slides earlier this week, and then I had no ability to, to fix it. Um, I didn't put Narcan on here. <laughs> we give Narcan to young people. We give Narcan to anybody that we possibly can um, at all times. Uh, but we do prescribe Suboxone and oral naltrexone um, to young people. Uh, we have a connection to youth and adult carceral systems in our community, and that's really vital. Um, they know that they can connect somebody to us. Um, you, a young person who is using drugs is probably, especially like if we're talking about meds, they're, they're some other system. They're connected to some, somebody. They're in trouble. Somebody is mad at them. <laughs> somebody is telling them what to do. And then, you, and then you get to be the person that's like, I don't want to tell you what to do. I am not going to be another adult doing that for you. I want to be your advocate, and I want to support you and we your goals. What do you want to do? What do you hope happens? Cool. So you want to get off probation. I also want you to get off probation. <laughs> How can we do that together? Okay, so here's what's in my wheelhouse. Um, uh, and then basically, like, our system is if I'm just 100% honest, is like entirely dependent on my counterpart and I existing um, when it comes to substance use. Um, uh, we sit on committees, we oversee policy and procedure, we are consulted, uh, we onboard people, we provide continuing education and support, we see every patient that wants to talk to somebody about any type of substance. Um, we are two people in a eight clinic system that serves 35,000 patients. <laughs> um, but the, the, the fact that we exist means that our system can do what it does. Um, we also do like, you know, there's lots of things. Okay, uh, Caitlin's house was this awesome thing that existed for a couple of months. It was the only withdrawal management program in Oregon they opened in summer, and they just closed because they didn't have funding. Our job, this is our job, as much as any other part of our job, we need to frickin' vote. We need to put pressure on our payers. You know, Kerrigan, I'm sorry. Like, you know, they're, they're doing this whole thing. We're talking a lot of smack about payers. Um, but, like, <laughs> why aren't we paying for the things? Uh, DePaul, form, you know, Fora, formerly known as DePaul, closed its youth inpatient program. One of the only ones we had in the state. Um, and this is because of funding and backing and lack of community support. So we need to uh, be vocal. Use all of your power. Anybody who is in this room has power. Everyone in this room has some privilege. Everyone in this room has an ability to improve this stuff on a systemic level. Because um, you're standing in front of me and you are like not dead and you're not in the gutter, so we can all do things. Um, consult with people that you're comfortable. Like, um, if you're, if we have a legislative session, if we're voting on a measure, look at 40's website and see how they are voting. All of these youth organizations in our town tell us how they are voting on stuff, how they recommend voting on stuff. They ask questions from people that they, from people that are running, about what they're doing and what they're going to do. And it's pretty damning when you see a legislator that's, you know, somebody who's running for some sort of, you know, high, like, you know, elected position who did not respond to a request from a young person's organization on questions about, like, youth with substance use disorders. Um, school boards, uh, fundraising efforts, all of these places do, like, galas and, like, all kinds of things and fundraising. Um, uh, almost every year for like my birthday and holidays, like uh, most people want to know what I want and I tell them to donate 25 bucks to some organization that I like. Um, uh, I don't need more stuff. Might need more books, but you know, I get those either way. Here's some takeaways I hope you have. Addressing substance use is appropriate in primary care. That's my big takeaway for you. We have, not, we have almost nothing in our community. That super sucks. We could be, like, primary care is a appropriate place to be doing a large portion of the work. We are, are we going to be the best person for, like, the youth that, that is, like, smoking fentanyl, like, multiple times a day, every day? We, we do want to be that person, but we have this huge spectrum that, like, we can totally do a lot for, especially if we build our system and we're intentional about our system. Uh, 
my favorite, continuing education on addiction, addiction medicine, um, substances, um, everyone can get them. This is uh, OHSU's addiction medicine consult line, Monday through Friday, eight to five, wonderful people, want to answer your call, want to answer your questions um, about anything substance related. It doesn't have to be like just medication. Um, and then yeah, anybody can do these. These are mostly free. Um, the Oregon Network um, in the spring is going to do a youth substance use disorder series. It's an hour a week for 12 weeks. Okay, that's my contact information. Contact me.